Hey, what's up everybody? I'm James. Um, <clears throat> I am a teacher until like uh, three weeks from, I guess, this Friday. And then I'll be looking for a job. Uh, come and find me if you have a job. <clears throat> but I'm really here today to talk about uh, kind of like relationships between music and math. Um, and I have like one kind of promise that I want to start out with. And <clears throat> that is that I promise that I will not try to ruin music with math. Um, <clears throat> really, like, I, I think this is interesting because like, you probably could kind of reduce music to math to an extent, but like, that's really not my intention. Um, really, like, <clears throat> uh, I think that like, sort of considering our passions are just kind of creative things from uh, especially like analytical angles, uh, it kind of like, can deepen our appreciation uh, for music and maybe like, kind of like, shed some light on uh, some interesting things going on in there. So like, I'm going to start out by talking about um, sort of how mathematics is kind of uh, related to music, I guess, since like ancient Greece. Um, <clears throat> I'm not a musicologist. I'm like not a mathematician. Um, so I just find this stuff kind of interesting and sort of like read different things on the internet about it. Um, other people's blog posts, uh, a research paper occasionally, uh, provided it's not more than like, I don't know, 15 pages, something like that. <clears throat> cool. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk some basic music theory. <laughs> so really, the kind of relationship between uh, math and music, I think, starts out with like kind of musical pitch, and this starts out with Pythagoras. So he had, I guess, like it was probably like something gnarly, like cat intestines, and um, he had probably fashioned a string <laughs> out of this. And he noticed that if you interrupted the string, say halfway, it produces a higher pitch. So maybe the the cat gut sounded like beep, and then <clears throat> when he cut it in half, it was like I probably can't hit this note, but beep. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> Except for, you know, it's like probably more in tune or maybe less in tune. I don't know, depending on sort of where he stopped it. <clears throat> so pitch is really like how high or low uh, a musical note is. Um, <clears throat> he also kind of, by moving this sort of bridge around uh, across this piece of cat gut, uh, noticed that some pitch relationships sounded better than others. Um, and he noticed that like, you know, there's sort of like a more harmonious quality or more consonant quality to some pitch relationships and a more dissonant quality to others. So this kind of, kind of consideration kind of progressed throughout the ages. Um, probably, uh, let's see, like during, I guess, the medieval period, they were especially conscious of certain types of harmonies. Um, has anyone heard of like the, the devil's interval or uh, Diabolus in Musica? There was like a certain interval that was like the most satanic interval. And like if you heard it, it probably had some corrupting influence. Um, <clears throat> on the keyboard, this is like sort of, uh, if you just consider the white keys, this is B to F. Um, it has this, like, it's, it's the coolest sounding interval, um, <laughs> naturally. <clears throat> um, but <clears throat> this kind of preoccupation with harmony and what notes kind of sound best together, and that's really what harmony is, is sort of simultaneous pitches. Or they could be pitches in sort of rapid succession. Um, so if we consider, like, sort of simultaneous pitches, we could think about this, like, in terms of, like, vertical, uh, if we were plotting this on a graph uh, over time. Um, <clears throat> It was like I just said I wouldn't ruin this with math. Um, and then like, so maybe like an arpeggio, uh, which is like a succession of notes that are in a chord, um, that would sort of be like a more horizontal distribution, or like across time. I could really just say that like the chord is really sort of when they happen all at the same time, and an arpeggio it would be like sort of when they're kind of displaced throughout time, but sort of next to each other. Um, <clears throat> so kind of preferences about harmony kind of evolved over time, um, so we have like different sort of patterns in like the Baroque period. Uh, like we sort of have a lot of going on with like uh, Bach and um, <clears throat> this sort of balances out and goes to a sort of more like tempered direction during the classical period um, with like Mozart and like those sorts of people. Then we have the pendulum swing in like the opposite direction. Um, we have these crazy romantics like doing things like um, making chords that like are comprised of like uh, six or like even maybe 12 notes, um, super crazy stuff. And that sort of comes in like at the end of uh, the 19th century. And that would be like Liszt, um, <coughs> Wagner, uh, crazy people like that. So, <coughs> and then finally uh, we have like all this like sort of this explosion of just like insane music kind of like after um, the Romantic period. <coughs> so as people sort of experimented more and more um, with different kind of musical constructs, they started doing more and more with rhythm. 
Um, and really one composer that comes to mind uh, is like Stravinsky, like the Rite of Spring. Have you all heard this piece before? A little bit. Um, if you've seen Fantasia, you've like probably heard it um, as well. It's like in there, there are all these like really sort of jerky rhythms, like they're really bizarre sounds, um, really kind of like experimental for the time. Uh, so much so that like it caused half of the audience during one of the like sort of performances of, Rite of the Rite of Spring. Uh, which is also accompanied by a ballet. It caused half the audience to like tear up their seats, and then like the other half of people like loved it and were like booing the people who were like throwing a tantrum. And it, in short, it was awesome. Like people were just like freaking out. Um, that was great. So, <clears throat> all this is to say that like really, there wasn't that much sort of done like that was innovative with rhythm. Um, at least not in the way that we think today. Like sure, you could say like uh, like box fugues. Um, <clears throat> And those types of works, um, there's like significant sort of rhythmic content there. But sort of in like kind of, I would say in canonical like Western music theory, there wasn't really that much interest in rhythm. It was really more about sort of harmonic relationships and, um, and actually sort of philosophical connotations sort of entailed by those relationships, like the devil or like sort of uh, having good taste and sort of a well-balanced um, sort of musical form, <clears throat> uh, things like that. Then, uh, sort of at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, this guy called Walter Piston comes along and starts analyzing uh, sort of harmonic changes in terms of rhythm. And so he's like, okay, I'm gonna look at sort of how, how frequently chords change in this piece. I'm gonna call this dimension of the music harmonic rhythm. <coughs> so, <coughs> like I said earlier, um, all types of 20th century composers and, and onward um, started experimenting more and more with, with rhythm. And it became sort of a more significant um, <clears throat> kind of dimension of musical practice. Uh, in addition, like we became sort of more aware of mu musical traditions from all around the world. And like that sort of led to its own kind of cross pollination between musical traditions. Um, <clears throat> and so like a lot of other, actually I feel like almost like every other musical tradition kind of like centralizes rhythm a little bit more. So about like, Fast forward to about like 14 years ago. In 2004, there was this guy named <coughs> um, uh, Godfrey Toussaint from, uh, I guess, McGill uh, University in Canada, who made this really stunning discovery. So <coughs> this discovery actually stems from the work of Euclid, another ancient Greek. Uh, and it's kind of an application of, of his greatest common denominator algorithm. But it's a really weird um, kind, of, kind of story. So, and this really has to do um, with something, we sort of label these Euclidean rhythms, but the algorithm actually came from this guy, uh, I don't remember his first name, but his last name is Bjorklund, and he developed this algorithm that was based on Euclid's greatest common denominator algorithm for coordinating the timing systems of, of neutron accelerators. So, <clears throat> they had this weird problem, I don't know exactly why, uh, I guess this is like important for understanding the behavior of neutrons or something, but they had to fire neutrons uh, at like sort of very precise and regular intervals um, in order to have like accurate test results. So <clears throat> how this kind of plays into um, <clears throat> sort of the Euclidean rhythm is we have like a certain number of steps. Say we have like eight steps and we want to evenly distribute, like as evenly as possible like say three beats over those eight steps. And we get something like, oh, my fingers don't really want to do this, but like a beat with two rests, a beat, another two rests that follow, and then a beat with one rest. So <clears throat> there's not like sort of the same amount of rest in between each beat. It turns out that like sort of by f like distributing different numbers of beats over these uh, steps, like depending on what numbers you kind of plug in, this describes like dominant rhythms in like musical traditions from like all throughout the world, which is insane. So that's to say that like there's like a mathematical algorithm for kind of generating uh, these like rhythmic patterns that are like kind of ubiquitous in uh, musical traditions and also poetry. So like some of them actually describe different like poetic uh, units called like poetic feet. Um, so like these would be like uh, anapes, uh, trochees, iams. Some other words I forgot since I was an English major. Um, <clears throat> but if that kind of didn't make any sense, uh, I built an app to kind of show us this. So 
basically the way this works is we'll have yeah plug this in <clears throat> so we'll have a pattern like this that is like not super i think i got it hopefully let's see this is not going to be super interesting so this is just like a kind of this basic four on the floor uh type type rhythm but we can also change this And this is a little bit more interesting. So it turns out that when you distribute, um, say, like five steps over 16 pulses, numbers that share no common factors or like non one common factors. So, like, that is to say, like, um, it's like four and 16, uh, the common factor there would be actually be like four or two. Um, when you combine these, like, sort of relatively prime numbers, um, which is like kind of the mathematician's way of saying what I just said, uh, we get more interesting rhythms. And so we could do like five over eight, which I think is actually, I think this is like a Cuban rhythm. Um, like I think this is from like Tresillo music. I might be wrong about that, but in the readme for this project, uh, there's like a list of a bunch of different rhythms that are sort of uh, associated with different musical traditions uh, around the world. And then there's a link to the actual research paper that uh, Dr. Toussaint wrote himself. Um, and there's just like tons and tons of, uh, <clears throat> tons and tons of uh, rhythms here. And um, that's a feature. <laughs> so if you want to find out uh, sort of more about uh, like those different rhythms that are associated with different musical traditions, um, you can like kind of look that up and then go find sample music on like YouTube or through the Library of Congress. And, the, uh, and I think freesound.org uh, has some sort of random uh, sound samples. Um, <clears throat> cool, that's about it. Uh, are there any questions? I'll just take like, questions for a couple minutes. If not, that's fine. Yeah. Yes. Let me pull up uh, the README real quick because I actually don't really have them memorized. <clears throat> so let's see here. <clears throat> so actually, one I mentioned like a poetic uh, poetic meter, which I think this one is an anapest. Um, <clears throat> So that's like sort of three beats and then sort of one silence. Uh, let's see what else I have here. <clears throat> so this is still loading. Great. <clears throat> let's see here. Actually, I think Tresillo, actually, I should have like realized this because like three is sort of in the name, but that would be three over eight. So let's hear that really briefly. Uh, this one's like, I think fairly common, um, not only to that like musical tradition, but th that one's found in other musical traditions as well. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> uh, there's a Greek and like Namibian and Rwandan rhythm, two pulses over five steps. This one's actually pretty cool. Kind of simple, but like this is sort of a smaller building block and can be kind of combined with other rhythms um, to produce like actually pretty intricate and complicated rhythms. And let's see, we could do one more. Let's see. Let's do, actually, someone give me a number. 48. 48, okay, this is awesome. Someone give me a much larger number, or a fairly <laughs> larger number. 172. 172. And so we can actually kind of accelerate this. Sounds like a heartbeat. <laughs> it does kind of sound like a heartbeat, yeah. <clears throat> That's true. Uh, one sort of other interesting thing, this is like kind of a total tangent, but cicadas, like cicadas could not, they like come out every 17 years. <clears throat> so if we think about like some of these cycles, um, they're kind of born on this like sort of cadence. Um, they exist on this cadence, it's like a matter of survival. So like the number 17 and like maybe like that particular prime number, it doesn't synchronize with other sort of predator uh, gestational or like life cycles. Um, so this allows them to kind of like, I don't know, pop out for like two weeks every 17 years and then like kind of go back underground. So they're really sneaky because prime numbers or because 17 or um, different ones, I guess like different cicadas like will come out every, like I think like other intervals. Like there's annual cicadas for sure, but there's like 11, uh, 11 year cicadas and like 13 year cicadas uh, as well. Cool. Thank you all so much.